Hi, with the release of the paperback version of Hacking Life, Systemized Living and Its Discontents, I wanted to finally record a web video version of my book talk, which should run about 40 minutes, and then if you watch it at 2x speed, little life hack tip, you should be able to see it all in 20 minutes, so a book distilled down into 20 minutes of your time. Let's begin. So I want to begin this as I began the book talking about the I kettle. Mark Rittman is a data analyst and has a server in his garage and sensors throughout his home and a smartwatch and health band on his wrist. And he had bought a I kettle, an automatic kettle that is connected to all of this sort of thing when it's working, to help him make his morning cup of tea. The idea is he could wake up in the morning. Uh, you know, things would turn on automatically, and by the time he got downstairs to the kitchen, his water would be ready to go. But the Wi-Fi and system integration was failing as he was tweeting, tweeting to his followers out there. And eventually he had to say, the iKettle is okay, apart from flaky Wi-Fi connectivity, my main issue is that there's no IFTTT or HomeKit integration. So I had to hack that together myself. And this did catch quite a lot of attention online, with The Guardian eventually publishing an article entitled, English Man Spends 11 Hours Trying to Make a Cup of Tea with Wi-Fi Kettle. Now this is amusing because, in part, it's a trivial thing, but it did catch the attention of the world. And I was intrigued as to why. Why was this of interest? And I think the reason why is because life is increasingly like an iKettle, a complicated system. And to succeed, like Rittman, you have to hack it together yourself. But I'm discussing two big ideas here, hacking and systems. So let's try to figure out what each one of those are before we go on further. So a system is composed of parts which can be decomposed and recomposed. It's governed by rules which can be understood, optimized, or subverted. And the term hackers comes from a set of folks at MIT, this is even before digital computers really, uh, back in the 1950s and then 60s, uh, there was a group, as Stephen Levy wrote about in his book about hackers, of folks who were associated with the MIT Model Railroad Club. And there was a subcommittee known as the Signals and Power Subcommittee, and those were the folks working on all the relays and wires and cables underneath the train platform. And this club developed sufficient jargon that over time they came up with a dictionary which would go on to be the hacker's dictionary which you can still buy now. And back in 1959 they defined a hacker as someone who avoids the standard solution. And I think this is really well exemplified by Paul Buchheit who was Google Employee 23. He uh, sketched out the earlier versions of Gmail and AdSense and also helped coin the term don't be evil. And in a blog post back in 2009, he wrote that every system has two sets of rules, the rules as they are intended or commonly perceived in the actual rules. And there's a gap between those two sets of rules. And the hacker is someone who can discern the difference, the gap between those rules, and seemingly perform miracles which violate the perceived rules when they understand the real rules of the system. And Bukai cite, hacking isn't limited to computers. He said there's systems everywhere, our entire reality. Systems of systems all the way down, much like the proverbial turtles. And so the hacker really has the capability to apply their ability to discern the real rules behind the perceived rules through every aspect of life, be it health, sports, or whatever it might be, and that's what we'll talk about. So life hacking sits at the intersection of culture and technology and larger concerns about wealth, health, work, relationships, and meaning. We have relationship hacking. We have philosophy and meaning hacking. We have productivity hacking. We have health, brain, mind hacking. And to understand this, I think we have to understand the ethos. So the hacker uses an individualistic and rational approach of systemization and experimentation. Lots of folks have tried to capture the gist of the hacking ethos, so I'm not alone here. And my 
take of these four attributes isn't terribly novel, but I put them together in this particular way, I think, to best understand life hacking. And let's look at each one of these attributes. So hacking is individualistic. For many years at lifehacker.com around Halloween, they would publish a set of evil life hacks. And they would preface each set every year by this sort of moral justification. And the editor at Lifehacker said, knowledge is power, and whether you use that power for good or evil depends on you. And this rationale sounds almost Machiavellian. It also evinces a technically inclined and individualistic mindset, which shouldn't be surprising, and I think we'll see this in a number of cases. The life hacking ethos, both the personality of life hackers and their culture, is very rational. So for example, when I was getting to know some life hackers and where they hung out, I encountered this website called Less Wrong. It's an online community and blog dedicated to refining the art of human rationality. In the Bay Area, where a lot of what I'm talking about occurred, there's also the Center for Applied Rationality, which offers workshops on patching the problems of human thinking. And there's also been a number of books. The most uh, notable, I think, is Algorithms to Live By, The Computer Science of Human Decisions, which advocate that we approach personal and social concerns the way computer scientists think about and solve their challenges. We also have systemization. So uh, here, in an interview between Gina Trapani and uh, someone who was writing a documentary or filming a documentary about life hacking, Trapani wrote that, or said, computer programmers have a very systematic way of looking at life, and of course, life hackers then apply that to most everything. The idea of a life hack is you can reprogram the way you perform tasks to make them a little faster and a little more efficient. I think really this is the most important of these four attributes. And then the fourth, which is kind of related, I think is best shown in this clip from the uh, short-lived Tim Veras show, where he, the author of the four hour work week, and I think the most popular manifestation of the life hacking ethos, uh, he had a series where he would give himself a particular challenge and then approach that in a very systemic, individualistic, rational, and experimental sort of way. I'm Tim Ferriss, best-selling author and human guinea pig. I'll show you how to make the impossible possible by bending the rules. I'll find the world's best teachers and push myself to the edge to deconstruct, decode, and demystify some of the world's toughest challenges in record time. If I can do it, so can you. So in that clip, we see Tim Ferriss characterizing himself as a human guinea pig, a right? very subject to experimentation. He wants to optimize, he wants to push to the edge, and he can do that by bending the rules, which very much goes back to what I spoke of earlier. And he says, if I can do it, you can too. And of course, that is the promise of self-help. And indeed, I argue that life hacking is really just the latest manifestation of self-help for the 21st century. So let's talk about that a little bit. So Starker wrote a really nice history of self-help genre, and he wrote that self-help books reflect the social cultural context, revealing something of the needs and wishes and fears of individuals in their period. So in the new millennium, I think life hacking reveals a lot of this. And as Rebecca Mead wrote in a profile for the New Yorker of Tim Ferriss, she wrote somewhat snarkily, every generation gets the self-help guru that it deserves. Now, you'll note in that there's a little bit of a critical sneer in that Mead point, and I'm sympathetic with what Starker wrote about this. He said, it's terribly easy to accord self-help books, the usual pop culture treatment, the shake of the head, the momentary sneer, the superior smile, and benign neglect. I think this is worth considering, worth engaging with, worth understanding. But I think we have to be careful about how we do that. So here we have journalist Robert Andrews talking about the book Getting Things Done, a very popular book that helps people improve their productivity. And he said this is a holy book for the information age. This holy book is turning stressed out worker bees into members of an unlikely new cult obsessed with keeping an empty inbox. 
Now, I felt this is hyperbole. We all have moments of being overwhelmed, especially members of the creative class, the people who are more likely to complain of having too little time than too much work the people for whom the work day is not punch in and punch out from nine to five, for whom the manager is not necessarily looking over their shoulder, but nonetheless feel like they have a lot to do and not enough time to do it. So Matt Thomas wrote a wonderful dissertation about life hacking, a critical take on life hacking, and he characterized it as a technologicalized form of self-help premised on the idea that we all must master ourselves using technology and make ourselves into productive, good little robots. Now, I think this is true, like some of the other things we've seen, but it's not the whole truth. Indeed, we can look at a lot of technology criticism of outsourcing your life, of the quantified self, of getting things done, of life hacking. and uh, These are all really important works, good works, but I think the tech critic who most influenced my approach to life hacking is Rebecca Watson. And she wrote that criticism that only offers rejection doesn't do us much good in the real world. Criticism that instead takes into account the realities and practicalities of user lives, guides readers in choosing how to use those technologies well. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do constructive tech criticism and I did that by way of making four distinctions. When I looked at this self-help for the information age, I found a need to distinguish between geeks and gurus, between nominal and optimal hacking, between black and white ha hacking, there's ethical gradations, and also between your enemies. And I want to speak about each one of those. So let's talk about the difference between life hacking, self-help, geeks, and gurus. And the way I understand this difference is that geeks are enthusiasts looking for ways to improve their lives. Gurus, on the other hand, sell lifestyle advice and their role as its vendor. So with respect to geeks, many of them share their hacks and experiments, but few of them desire or manage to become lifestyle coaches. And then the th question I think we have to ask of this group of life hackers is what motivates them and what meaning do they take from the hacking? So, for example, here is someone I discuss in the book, Valerie Aurora, and her earlier approach to dating. She's very geeky and systematizing, and she came up with this Google spreadsheet that she shared on online that other people could take advantage of and use of themselves. And here she has different people and the different attributes that uh, she wanted to account for, and she had different uh, showstoppers and deal breakers and things that she prized highly. But she wasn't trying to become a relationship guru out of this. She was just approaching this in a very systematic way and sharing that with other people. But interestingly, she did find that dating isn't just a search problem, but one of negotiation. She ended up dating someone who uh, ticked off a number of her deal breakers. But after some discussion, with a little bit of flexibility, she realized you know, the problem isn't just one of finding the one, but of some give and take with another person. Now for gurus, I know that term isn't always flattering, but I don't necessarily use it as an insult. Rather, I have a different sort of question I want to ask of gurus. What assumptions underlie their advice, and is it sound and worth the cost? So I think an example of this is James Altucher. Uh, he's an interesting character. His life hacking, minimalist kind of approach to life has been written about in the New York Times and on Boing Boing. And Definitely one of the skeezier, shadier sort of things that he does is uh, sells a newsletter and some advice on taking advantage of Bitcoin and altcoin type cryptocurrencies so you can make lots of money. And now he says if you subscribe to his newsletter, you'll be able to also do this sort of thing and perhaps turn your thousands of dollars into millions of dollars. And this is a really hard sell. and. Uh, for a period on social media, these sort of ads, and Altucher's in particular, became, uh, they were just glutting the system. Uh, and both Facebook and I think Twitter banned these sort of ads for a period, or maybe Google and Facebook banned cryptocurrency ads because they just were ridiculous and so overhyped. So I think this is an example of a techno-hype con predicated on get-rich values. So 
Okay, so let's look at the distinction between nominal and optimal hacking. So by nominal, I mean something is within the expected range. So for example, the power at my outlet is between 114 and 126 volts. You know, so it's about plus or minus 5%. Whereas optimal is at or pushing the leading edge. And I think, again, we saw an example of that in the Tim Ferriss clip. And a theoretically optimal solar cell would yield 86.8% efficiency. And the difference for hackers that I think is related to intention is a one of keeping up or surpassing your peers. The nominal swimmer wants to be good enough to safely enjoy the water, whereas the optimal swimmer wants to be the best at racing upstream. I think we can see some of this with respect to uh, folks who try to take extremely cold ice baths, people who want to hold their breaths for extremely long periods of time, uh, just that A type of personality that Tim Ferriss often speaks of, I think there we're talking about optimal sort of hacking. Now you might say, why are you using the term nominal instead of normal? Well, I think the critique of normal is important, right? Normal speaks to a, uh, it, there's an assumption inherent in the notion of normal. And I think that's an important critique to say maybe not everyone needs to be normal, but that's not the sort of thing I wanted to get at. The distinction I wanted to draw was between like that, between reconstructive surgery and cosmetic surgery or therapy and enhancement. And I think this distinction can be seen in every domain of life. So here we have the hacker's diet. This is one of the first instances of life hacking that I can think of originally back in 1991. And John Walker is a relatively well-known software engineer and he wasn't happy with his sedentary lifestyle and his eating and the consequences on his fitness. So he wrote this very early uh, hacker's diet. And he wrote, I'm an engineer. I decided to approach weight loss as an engineering problem. And this book is not written for people who or wish to become obsessed with their health. This is people who want to get up to a nominal sort of state. On the other hand, we have someone like Serge Fougot. And he had a number of flashy blog posts back in 2017 about his optimized life and he writes I've optimized my sleep my nutrition exercise done thousands of tests taking dozens of prescriptions of drugs and hundreds of supplements worked with some amazing doctors meditated over a thousand times did psychotherapy took MDA and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in all of it so clearly this is someone that wants to optimize their life and some of the concerns I would have about this is that sometimes self-optimizing can be suboptimal. You might be optimizing the wrong thing, optimizing one thing at the expense of everything else, optimize for too long, especially when the context has changed, or really when you should be doing something else. So let's talk about my third set of distinctions, some ethical, ethical degradations between white hat hacking, black hat hacking, and the gray hat hacking in between. Those are terms that computer hackers use, and I think they apply to life hackers as well. So again, one approach to understanding hacking is, is, is rule breaking. So as the famous computer venture capitalist and philosopher essayist Paul Graham wrote, ugly and imaginative solutions have something in common. They both break the rules. They're both types of hacking. But little thought is given to the ethics of rule breaking in the life hacking context. The virtuous hackers are white hat and the most hawkish are black hat. And there are many shades of gray between. And let me give you a couple examples to sort of illustrate this. And let's focus on one of the more sometimes unsavory, but certainly something that gets a lot of attention, pickup artists. I think this is a type of relationship hacking where people want to understand the system in this case of men of attracting and bedding women. And this strikes me as a darker shade of gray. This is from uh, Mystery, the guy who had a reality TV show on VH1. And he had a book that came out called The Mystery Method. And all of this blew up after Neil Strauss's book, The Game, came out. And Mystery was the, the main character in that book. And so in his book, he says, push each set as far as you can just for the practice. Use Kino escalation and compliance testing as much as possible. And so what he's advocating here is that when men interact with women, uh, even if they're not particularly interested in the women, they should practice these skills. 
Kino escalation is when you touch someone, and so you just might try touching a woman's hand, and if she doesn't object there, then maybe a shoulder, an elbow, uh, maybe eventually culminating, you know, by touching her hair. And the compliance testing is asking her to do something. So first you just ask her to look at her watch and tell you the time, or look at something that you have, and ask her to turn around so you can see your dress. And this seems manipulative and skeezy. Someone else uh, in Neil Strauss's The Game, Tynan, who was known as the herbal, as herbal in that particular book, uh, he is a, a lighter shade of gray here. And so he too, after that book came out, wrote a book called Make Her Chase You, the practical guide of attracting girls who are out of your league, even if you're not rich or handsome. And here his take is a little bit different. It's not about manipulating women. It's about men coming to understand uh, how to improve their lives. And in defense of pickup, he wrote that a young man who's trying to improve his skills can either ignore that and dismiss pickup wholesale, or he can begin down the difficult road of learning social skills, understanding women, and becoming the kind of guy that girls want to be with. So on one hand, in this ethical spectrum, we have sort of manipulative approach, and on the other hand, we have a self-improvement approach. And so when I think about hacking and life hacking in particular, I ask, is the life hacking advice being given self or other oriented? Is it exceptional or universal? So for example, if you advocate that people, uh, as James Altucher has, for example, talked about kind of being really pushy and uh, trying to cut in line or do something like that, um, if everyone did that, would the world be a better place? Some of the hacks, like I also speak of very early life hackers, though they didn't use that name, who were quadriplegic and needed help around the kitchen. So they had a nice hack of like how to turn on a faucet with a spoon, a wooden spoon. Uh, and, you know, that's useful if everyone uses it. And then finally, simply, is the hack beneficial or harmful? I think some of the things that people advise out there aren't grounded in good advice, good science, and just they're not that good, so they can actually be harmful. And then that brings me to the last distinction I want to make, near enemies. And I inherit this notion from Buddhist philosophy. It's not widely known or discussed, but I think it's a powerful sort of way of thinking about things. And so virtues like compassion have an obvious opposite. So animosity is understood as the far enemy of compassion. But there are also sentiments that masquerade as virtues. So for example, you might feel pity towards someone, and it's easy to confuse that with compassion, but it's really not. We might think of it as a near enemy of compassion. And so what I did in the various chapters in the book, I considered the near enemies of virtues associated with work, wealth, health, relationships, and meaning. So let's look at one of these and also the pressing questions we face in the new millennium. So in an economy that prizes immediacy and flexibility, how do we manage time? And in a culture that values autonomy and self-reliance, how do we motivate ourselves? One approach is to maximize your productivity. So here we have Nick Winter, who wrote this nice little self-published book called The Productivity Hacker. And he did a lot of really interesting things to take his productivity to what he called ludicrous levels. And so, for example, one of the things he does is he publishes a real-time stream of how productive he's being, uh, his work efficiency by hour of the day. And by committing to this and by publicly committing to this, he feels like he has the incentive to stay on task and to be focused so he doesn't embarrass himself. But this can also be a near enemy in that people realize that fixating on productivity can be a distraction in and of itself. So here we have James Bedell writing about what sometimes life hackers refer to as productivity porn. And he writes, I was addicted to the idea of being productive, of finding a way to make it all easy. And he would spend a lot of time trying to learn new systems and downloading apps and whatnot. But really, he came to realize that the virtue of effectiveness is not necessarily the same thing as efficiency. Uh, you can be very efficient at being in a boat on a pond and 
rowing with just one side of the boat and going around in circles. Very efficient, but that's not necessarily effective. So let's talk about wealth. In a world in which material excess is now as much a problem as deficiency, how do we relate to stuff? Well, one approach is to accumulate a lot of stuff. Uh, and a lot of the digital minimalists and life hackers that I spoke to had that phase in their life. But then they end up doing something what Tynan or Herbal and the game does, which is to be a minimalist, to maybe just have a hundred things or to have everything that you need in a book bag. And Tynan every year posts a gear post where he says, this is the stuff. I think this is the year he finally moved over to a croc type shoe that he resisted it for a long time. And this gave people some degree of satisfaction and contentment for a couple of years. Though just in the course of writing this book, some of the folks I spoke to, for instance, uh, Rita Holt here, which is a pseudonym, uh, when I went back to verify some of my sources, I found that she took everything she wrote off the web about digital minimalism, but fortunately I was still able to contact her. And I was like, what happened? You were traveling the world, tweeting your uh, digital minimalist uh, lifestyle and advocating for it, and it's all gone. And she wrote that it seemed like a facade, another pattern that everyone fell into, shouting about how it's so awesome, but they were really just joining the herd. And so she got out, scrapped the website, all her posts and any links or interviews she might have put out there. And I think this speaks to the realization that minimalism is not necessarily the same thing as freedom. Minimalism, too, can be a near enemy. Let's talk about health, then. So in a period of increasing uncertainty but ubiquitous monitoring, how do we know what really works? Does chocolate lead to weight loss? Seth Roberts is an important and compelling character in the story of life hacking, and the quantified self in particular. That was the area, the domain of life hackers that he most strongly identified with and really helped give birth to. And he was at the earliest quantified self meeting. He wrote a book about uh, the Shangri-La diet, about how not tasting your food can lead you to eat in a way that's a little bit healthier. And one of his other interesting observations from tracking his life and then seeing what little changes he made in his day and what that might do was that he had experimented with eating a lot of pork belly fat to help with his sleep. But getting pork belly fat every day in his diet was a little bit difficult. And he was also tracking all kinds of things like his ability to do simple little math puzzles, how quickly you do them on his computer. And one day he uh, ate a lot of butter at a restaurant, which is much easier to get than a big chunk of pork fat. And he noticed that when I started eating a half a stick of butter every day, I suddenly got faster at arithmetic because he was doing these little puzzles on his computer. And, you know, he, he got a couple of microseconds. But the sad thing is, is that uh, he did publish a book, and he had his blog and a forum, and he was very popular in his community, but he was actually going to start writing a quantified self life hacking column for the New York Observer. And his first column about how butter makes me smarter was also his, his final column. He died of heart disease. Um, apparently, he had uh, not been tracking his cholesterol, but he had had a calcium scan that led him to think that he was in good health. But still, Roberts is not the only quantified self, life hacker person who takes risks in what they do. And I think the sad consequence here is that biohacking yourself does not necessarily lead to wellness. Let's look at relationships. When others are only within a finger's reach on our devices, how we connect and relate to one another. Well, I've already spoken about the pickup artist, and in Mystery's book, he writes that he was a geek and he's taught this to a lot of other geeks. With me as your friend and guide, you'll start uploading Venusian arts programming into your behavioral system. All right, so you're going to hack your system, you're like a computer, you're going to reprogram yourself. And I figured it out, the typical sort of self-help cell and what is his evidence he knows how to do this because he has a girlfriend but years later he didn't seem all that more content uh, he, i think he was struggling with depression and in fact neil strauss as the game ends with uh mystery being committed and neil strauss going off to a cell uh, 
sex addiction sort of program. And in 2016, Mystery wrote, I've been stuck inside without friends or a girlfriend or any hope of seeing my children, my existence. I hate it. It's futile. It's lonely. It's boring. I didn't deserve this. It's almost too hard to keep going. So I think the thing we can learn here is that the sexual conquest promised by pickup artistry is not the same thing as genuine connection. Which brings us to meaning. One of the stories that goes throughout my book is that you can follow some of these life hackers going from one thing to the other. First, they want to be productive so they can be very uh, efficient at work and make lots of money and have houses and things to fill those houses with, but then they realize that's not satisfying. So they then think, I need to get rid of everything, and they do the minimalist thing, and they travel the world as digital minimalists, and then they realize that's not quite enough, and then they need realize they need to focus on the relationships, and maybe that satisfies them or not. Ultimately, many of them end up thinking, okay, what is the whole part of life? What is our purpose? So when we realize that nothing, even the most clever hacks, will save us from uncertainty and loss, how do we find meaning in life? So in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, a lot of tech companies, two things have really been quite popular with respect to that question. Buddhism, mindfulness, and stoicism. And here we have Meng Ten, who was the founder of Search Inside Yourself. This was a program within Google. He used to be an engineer, but at Google you're, they have folks that, and employees that are able to teach classes and things that they're interested in. So he started this class there. It became really popular. Google let him dedicate full-time attention to this, and eventually he spun it out as a nonprofit. And in, uh, in a Wired article... He said, everybody knows that EI, emotional intelligence, is good for their career, and every company knows that if their people have EI, they're going to make a shitload of money. Now, he's not that crass all of the time, but again, we can see that he has taken a sort of particular approach to this way of living one's life. And one of the things that Meng often participated in was this Wisdom 2.0 conference, again, very often occurring in California where various companies, especially Google, would bring together some of their own employees and advocates for these sort of things, various mindfulness teachers, tech gurus. And they were criticized in this particular protest for not really being sensitive to the consequences of the gentrification of San Francisco. So here a protest group got up and chanted eviction-free San Francisco. And this has been a wider critique of self-help and mindfulness in the tech and work sector, that this is just being adopted to mollify workers who might be discontent, who might be overworked. And instead of dealing with that particular problem as a society, uh, the individualistic approach is to say, well, you need to meditate, and that will solve all of your problems. And I think this real, real, you know, brings us to the realization that this new tech-infused wisdom 2.0, as it's been called, is not necessarily the same thing as wisdom. So those were the distinctions I make in the book. And as I was thinking about the book, I was trying to come up with a metaphor of how to describe, how do I sum all of this up? And I toyed with calling the book Blinkered, because I thought the metaphor of horse blinkers, right, putting those blinkers on the side, conveyed the tensions inherent to life hacking. Life hacking is a tool and in an age of ubiquitous distraction, blocking the periphery can be helpful. And in an age of economic turbulence, staying focused on a better future is valuable. And I'm not alone in concluding this. I was uh, quite tickled to see in 2017, as I was finishing up my first draft of this, that Panasonic had released in, among its design uh, kind of speculative group this thing called wear space, which is a cubicle for the head. And they describe, they say the motivation was today's workers who are required to demonstrate high levels of performance are demanding personalized spaces. And so this product that kind of wraps around like blinkers for the information age creates visual and psychological boundaries instantly, I can imagine. It's handy in daily life, such as learning a new language, building up your focus, or working at home when a spouse is playing with your children. So this is offered as a, as a tool, as a solution for the problems of the 21st century. And so life hacking does create a sort of tunnel vision, which does have merits. 
but I think it also leaves much overlooked, especially among those bent on optimizing. Hackers can fail to appreciate they are in danger of stepping off the edge, and for those around them, there is a risk of being bumped aside or trod underfoot. So that's the gist of my book. Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to watch it at 200% or 2x speed, and do leave any comments if you like or send me an email. Thank you again.